Hi. Um, I want to start by talking about uh, <clears throat> what a country is. Um, so typically when we think of a country, we think of something with, you know, borders on a map, uh, whether it's Canada or Guatemala, uh, England. Um, you know, we, we look on a map and there are lines that tell us where that country is. So, for example, I drew a little map here. Um, here is where you would typically think France and England are. Um, that would just be a typical way, typical way of portraying it. What I want to do is take that way we normally think when we think about a country and reflect on a few ways that that's misleading, problematically misleading. Um, so the first, and pretty pivotal for what I'm going to go on to say, is uh, sticking with, with England and France, um, I want to think about the reality of what those countries were um, from, let's say, roughly uh, 1600 to 1950. Um, England uh, was the center of a, of a worldwide empire which at its fullest extent was probably roughly like this, as the British Empire. Uh, and as you can see from this map, the British Empire is like, I don't know, somewhere in the range of a quarter of the world. Um, I mean, the pictures are a little distorted, but um, there's a lot more to it than just uh, this little thing here. So if you were trying to understand what England is, um, you'd miss a lot if you only looked at what was going on in that little island. Same with France. At roughly the same time, here's, here's France. So there's France. And there's England. They take up a lot of the world. Um, a, lot, a lot different from this. Um, and indeed, uh, just carrying on, when France and England uh, Fought, for example, in the Napoleonic Wars. Typically, when you, if you hear about that as France fighting with England at the time of Napoleon, you imagine it as a conflict between those two little areas dropped out and dro drawn out of the map of Europe. The reality of that conflict was, of course, more, much more substantial than that. That that what was at stake in that conflict was the a lot of the control of uh, the rest of the world. Uh, in particular, the uh, Middle East was an issue, uh, Egypt and so on. Um, and so when France and England were fighting, it wasn't just conflict about people defined by these two little bordered areas, about those two little bordered areas. It was people fighting about the uh, control of those huge areas. Let, let's, let me just say that first. Um, so just at a, at a, at a very simple... Um, quantitative spatial level you can see by comparing those two maps you can see why it would be somewhat misleading to think about England just as the country marked out as England on the map because the reality of that country can't be separated from the reality of so much of the rest of the world that it's controlling and shaping and all the rest um, that's the second way to think about a country when you if you think about an Englishman or a British person um, it doesn't that typically doesn't just mean that, that that's someone who happens to live within the confines of those little bordered out areas on the map um, it typically also means that they speak a certain language um, and that, they, that they have a certain culture right? and so we, by England we also mean a kind of a culture which is reflected in uh, language uh, it's reflected but also in style of language like the accent and so on it's reflected in um uh clothing cl dress dressing styles uh style of cuisine uh, all sorts of things so as i said broadly what you would think of as a culture um and so when we th uh, when we think of um uh a country that way uh we're th when we're thinking of we're thinking of people united by a culture which is more what we would typically associate with the word nation. We're, uh, we, we call it a nation when we talk about a, um, a people united by a sense of something. And in that case, it typically also means something even more like uh, sharing the same religious views, uh, sharing the same sense of history, and so on. 
Um, anyway, uh, I could go on about that. Um, but but once again, uh, when you think of a country that way, looking at the borders of, on the map can be very misleading. Uh, think about it, for example, similarly in the context of elections. You know, there's a reason why it makes sense to drop electoral districts. When you're trying to establish a representative government, you want uh, the different bodies of people who define your culture to be able to put forward their representatives. And so it makes sense sometimes to have, you know, a city area as a voting area and uh, the farming area outside the city as a separate voting area because of the realistic belief that those are different constituencies. The idea that the, the people who make up the farming community have different values and different concerns and different needs than the people who live in the city. And you want each of those groups to be able to give voice to its concerns. Um, and so you divide them up and you let these people vote for a representative and you let these people vote for a representative. Well, that's one of the reasons why making the boundaries makes sense, right? Gerrymandering, on the contrary, is when people uh, redraw the boundaries of electoral districts to uh, pull in votes for themselves so that the district, instead of representing um, a kind of a natural division in the community or a constituency in its own right, uh, represents uh, quantitatively a pocket of voters for this or that party. And so in that case, what you're doing is instead of having representatives that reflect the makeup of your, of your um, population, you're dividing the population up according to the representatives that you want to put in office. So it's kind of the, the opposite of representation, really. Um, but my point about that is that in, in something like gerrymandering, you can see an example of where the lines that are drawn do not automatically correspond with a, a meaningful body of people. And so the same thing is true with the outline of England. Um, it may or may not be the case that that that, that what happens to fall within that boundary is the English culture, both in the sense that there could be lots of people, lots of life in there that for one reason or another you might want not to call English culture, but also in the sense that the realities of the English culture might exist significantly outside those boundaries. Anyway, so those are just two two things. First of all, I want to give that sort of quantitative spatial uh, sense of what England is that's very different from what the sense of what England is that you'd get if you just looked at a little map. Uh, uh, and also the cultural sense, which identifies something that's quite different. Um, third one is <clears throat> sticking with that notion of the, initially sticking with that notion of the culture. When you think about a cultural group, um, England as a culture, that comes with a lot of other stuff too. It comes with um, uh, political structures, economic structures, and, and social stratification, hierarchy, that sort of thing. So in other words, uh, if you do have a nation, let's 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 not think about a modern nation. Let's think about an ancient, just sort of fairly traditional nation. You can imagine a body of people that are united by uh, religious views, um, maybe parts of, it, of uh, an ancient Mesopotamian culture, or maybe the ancient Hebrews, something like that. Um, uh, the Vedic peoples in uh, uh, Northwest India. Um, you can you can imagine in. Uh, in any of those groups that there really is a body of people that that carry on a sort of unified cultural life reflected in language uh, food styles religious beliefs and all the rest but that that doesn't mean they're all exactly the same on the contrary uh, part of the religion that unites them for example might very rigorously distinguish between um, you know the priests and the other people you know and the priests may be uh, granted much more status and power and wealth than the other people, uh, or you know, in the Mesopotamian culture, um, maybe the the king is a god and the god is king, uh, and so they can't really separate the religious views that define the very way those people make sense of their world from the fact that the bulk of the of the people live and interpret themselves as subjects of a, a king who's interpreted as divine or something like that. So at, the, at a very extreme level, you can imagine stratification or, or hierarchy there within a nation, within a, a, a cultural group like that. Uh, in the case of, of um, India, for example, and caste, the caste society, uh, that stratification can be quite extreme, you know, and you can imagine um, uh, many distinctions between uh, groups of people that, that say you know, these people can only be here they can't be here these people can do these things they can't do these things these people can can touch these people these people can't touch these people you can imagine a very rigid and, and extreme 
hierarchization of groups of people um, based on this notion of caste, where in a fundamental way, those people belong to the same culture. Uh, but within that culture, there are these radical differences. Um, when you take that, so uh, when you take that third notion of power structures, or actually, let me, let me add a thing. Then. So again, what's, what, what's misleading about the map? Well, England isn't so much, you know, just the borders as it is uh, an organized social system. Okay. When you take that idea and go back to that question of borders, um, the, the issue becomes even more striking because if you then look at the reality of, let's say, England between, let's say, 1600 and 1950, uh, there is a cultural uh, the culture there. There is a society there. Maybe that's the word I should use. There is a society there. Uh, and you can't understand the organization and the reality of the society as, exi as it exists within the borders of that little, that little bit of the the British Isles that you call England, um, you can't really grasp the organization of that without seeing the way the organization is integrated with things that are going on in all those other places all over the rest of this map. So you can, uh, so in other words, um, if you think of the so society as a cultural reality, as a society um, that is in significant ways shaped and defined by the social relationships of stratification, political organization, economic dependency, et cetera, et cetera. If you, if you, if you look at this society in that way as this, as this kind of system, um, then, then all those things that are going on in uh, India and Africa and North, British North America and uh, Australia are part of that system. Uh, the economic reality of the things that are going on that island can't be separated from the economic things that are going on in those other places, like largely kind of exploitation. Um, uh, and the the wealth, and therefore you know the standard of living, but therefore also the uh, general quality of social life that's possible in the little island territory marked out by those boundaries uh, can't really exist without the very different and very unpleasant social life and stratification that's going on in all those other areas that are the colonies. So let's have a quick little reflection on on. Um, notion of the country, but what, what I wanted to do was initially say, okay, what do we mean by a country? And to to start with what I think is kind of um, the default starting point for most of us because of the way we're brought up and the way we use the words, the way we look at maps, the default position of thinking of countries in terms of these nicely little defined things you see on maps, and just reflecting a little bit on what we mean by a country um, so that without too much work, you can see that the reality that you're trying to talk about there is actually... Um, it's not that it has no relationship to those lines on the map, but but uh, but it's really misleading to imagine that country to be contained within and defined by that little um, geographical area that's that's mapped out. Uh, so that's that's where I wanted to start with this with the idea that, that there's something misleading about that, and. Uh, so that that should be a kind of a provocation to any of us to think a little more rigorously about what the reality, the social reality is that we live in. It's easy for me and the people around me, for example, to say, "Oh, I'm Canadian," and to identify ourselves with Canada. But but then we should ask the question, "Well, what is Canada?" And probably not many of us could say very much in answer to that question. Probably what most of us could do is pull out a map. And say, oh, well, there's ten provinces, and the country looks a bit like this, and it's got a prime minister, and uh, it's got a handful of big cities, and blah blah blah. We speak English, you know. You could say these things um, that that are quite pointedly ignorant, right? That 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 really reflect no meaningful understanding of uh, the country understood as a society, where that means the first that sort of sense of you know cultural identity that I've brought out but then even more means the whole system of social relationships that are uh, constitutive of that reality um, where in particular um, those relationships imply or show demonstrate 
that the society cannot be uh, held within the limits of that little of, of those little borders uh, because of uh, structural relationships of um, dependency and interaction with all, all these other things that a country either controls or is controlled by or something like that uh, anyway so that so it should make us reflect on that uh, so then uh, so then now think about any of us um, you know I was using my little maps uh, I've used the map of the British Empire and the French Empire well the French because I want to go on and talk about it but I use those maps because those are those are the most pronounced ones from recent history it seems to me to show that sort of radical difference in scale between where you have to think about to think about the reality of this country from uh, what you would typically think of if you just glanced at a map. Um, uh, but I also use those, well, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing, but let me quickly do it. I'm also using it because the realities of those empires, as well as the Spanish and Portuguese empires that pre immediately preceded them, and the Dutch empire that developed roughly contemporaneously with these, uh, those those five probably more than anything else um, for about four and a half centuries uh, fr from roughly 1500 right when the Spanish and Portuguese started sailing out from Europe to uh, North and South America so-called and to India and so on um, until roughly uh, the 1940s and 50s when these powers in particular Britain and France uh, started to let go of their imperial identities uh, for, for those roughly 450 years those European nations uh, were defining the reality of the world which as an, again, another aside is not unrelated to why the wars between the European powers in the 1914 to 1918 and then in 1939 to 1945 uh, were called world wars um, <clears throat> anyway, um, that, so uh, what I wanted to get at, though, with, with talking about that is that any of us, all of us, we're all born, uh, we're born into the, a world in, that is not just a blank slate. We're not born into a neutral world. We're born <clears throat> into a world that's, um, that's already organized in this way, and it's, it's a kind of system into which we're inserted. And that's really what it means to grow up and become a functioning member of the social world is to um, learn how to inhabit your position in that system um, <clears throat> uh, so that that's my first point I just wrap up one thing and then that will be the end of my first little section and then we'll move on to something else um, but so you know, I've said a few things just to talk about that in general, and one you could grab your average history book or whatever to talk about those realities of uh, European colonialism and so on, uh, European history and culture, sort of from the outside. Say these people did these things in this way. Here's the way the economics was organized, and so on. And those things would all be true, and they're very important. They're very, very worth learning. Um, Fanon uh, describes this the situation. Uh, not so much from the outside like that but from the inside he describes the situation of what it's like to grow up into that situation into that world so as i said we're all we're all born into that world and we become someone by by um sort of figuring out how we're going to be inserted into that system and, and making our way into it um well uh that's what fanon is describing he's, he's saying here i am uh born and i discover i belong to a system i'm going to find my way into it and i'm going to tell you what that world is like um, uh, what's striking about what he does is that he's describing the experience of growing up to that into that situation when roughly you're on the losing side whereas uh, most of us and by us I mean the people to whom I imagine I'm speaking which are students in a few university classes although I can easily imagine other people who will see this and I can also easily imagine some people in those classes who don't fit what I'm about to say but generally I would say all of us most of us at least uh grew up on the winning side and so um we like fanon have had that experience of growing up and being inserted into this very same system but uh one of the important reasons for reading fanon's work is because of how different his experience of growing up into that system is from what is presumably the experience of any of us um, and that's important both in its own right it's in, it's important for us to understand uh, what the experience is of Fanon and, and 
uh, the very large number of other people who grow up into what I was just calling the sort of losing side of that system. But it's also important for us uh, to uh, encourage us to develop a more critical reflection on our own selves and to recognize that we too have grown up into that system and that our, our own realities you know, the nice things we have and the nice things we think about ourselves um, owe a lot more to our placement in that economic system uh, than anything that we've done individually. Uh, in other words, um, uh, Fanon's writing is certainly and probably primarily meant to be a kind of consciousness raising for uh, oppressed people, specifically black uh, um, people who suffer racial oppression, black, black, black people in the context of the world she's talking about. Um, it's meant to help those people and encourage those people, help and encourage those people to um, understand the situation and resist it. Uh, but it should also be, a, in another sense, a kind of consciousness raising for those of us who are on the side of the, um, the, the, the very privileged side of the sort of winning position in the imperial world. Um, so I'll come back to that a little bit later, but I wanted I wanted just to say that at the beginning to talk about the city as, as or sorry of the country as a way to get into thinking about what the reality of social life is, to then bring out this idea that we we grow up not into a neutral world, but that we're inserted into a social system, and that uh, you can grow up on the winning side or the losing side. We've probably grown up on the winning side. And I was trying about growing up on the losing side. Let me let me say one more thing, and then uh, just about that. So. More, most obviously, um, what he's talking about in the essay that I'm going to focus on first, which is the lived experience of the black man from black skin, white masks. Um, most obviously, he's talking about uh, race and the oppression of black people. Um, uh, in, and he's drawing, describing that more or less from the inside, which is to say more or less phenomenologically. He's describing uh, the lived experience of that. Um, and the, the essay... Uh, more or less describes a series of stages he goes through in in grasping the reality of the situation. So his analysis moves from um, sort of discovering racism as a more or less personal phenomenon to gradually grasping it, comprehending it as a, a cultural, uh, political, and historical phenomenon. Um, and so that's what the essay is going to is kind of it's sort of the story in a way of his education that is also meant and to be a kind of education for someone else who can identify with that experience. Um, so that's what I'm going to get to. Um, but before that, uh, I want to talk about some key ideas he uses in the essay. So so ba so basically, I've, I think I've completed my first of four points. Uh, I'm going to now move on to a second point, which is looking at uh, some of the uh, particularly powerful ideas he deploys. My third point then will be to turn to this thing I've just said, his description of his own experience. And then my fourth point will be to bring that, um, or, and fourth and final point, will be to bring that back to reflecting on um, our political reality.